Well, good morning, and it's great to be with you. Praise the Lord, and uh, looking forward to the time when we'll be all back together. But in the meantime, the Lord is with us, and he's going to meet us, and he's going to strengthen us. I uh, want to continue. We've been reading through the book of Genesis and looking at the life of Abraham and life lessons in faith. And, of course, uh, Abraham had the promise of God, and he looked for the hope in Isaac. So this morning, as we look at Genesis chapter 21 and we read the story, I'm going to call this message, Isaac the Hope. He was the one that was hoped for. Let's begin in Genesis 21, starting in verse 1. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abram was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on that day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to him, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac." And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away, and she departed and wandered into the wilderness of Beersheba. So we have this story of this expectation. Abraham had waited 25 years to have a child. You talk about a picture of hope. And each of these patriarchs, Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob, are, are also pictures for us. Abraham is really a picture of faith. And even though he wavered, he wasn't perfect, but he never gave up that hope that he had of the promise of God. And here we see Isaac was born as a fulfillment of that promise. And so Abraham being faith, Isaac representing hope, and then Jacob later on will be speaking to us about love because Jacob was the most transformed person of all three patriarchs. It's interesting, Abraham had a name change from Abram to Abraham. And uh, Jacob had a name change from Jacob, meaning supplanter, to Israel, which is one, uh, one who overcomes with God, loosely translated. Isaac never had a name change. It's interesting. Because Isaac, representing hope, is fixed. The hope that does not change. It is fixed. It is firm. And we're going to look at this picture of Isaac as a picture of our hope in Christ. So even the rabbis identified Isaac with the messianic expectation and hope. And even his name, Isaac, he will laugh, was referring to uh, the days of the Messiah when God will restore the earth and joy will come back. Of course, we're looking forward to that hope as well, the blessed hope of our return and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, and that is something we're looking forward to. So we're going to look at this morning about hope and the importance of hope and, and understanding how this narrative fits in with us and how we can apply it to our lives. The first thing I want to say is um, uh, Hebrews 11.1 1 says this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So we see that faith has to attach itself to something. And it attaches itself to hope. It's the things not yet seen, the things hoped for, and faith is confident. In fact, it says assurance. That word assurance is a wonderful word in English. It's, you could translate it confidence, um, confident, uh, peaceful. We have that sense of tranquility. We have assurance. 
the assurance of things hoped for. In other words, it's going to happen. Of the things that we hope for, the conviction of things not seen. So we can't yet see it. And yet we can hope confidently like Abraham who was confident in the promise of God. I like what the King James says. This faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith actually has substance. Now faith is not in our ability to believe, but in the thing that we believe in. So we believe in Jesus Christ. He is, we don't see him, but our hope is in Christ. And that confidence is rock solid. So let's take a look at the word hope for a moment. I remember talking to a friend about the word hope. And he shocked me. He said it was the most negative word in the English language. I said, why do you say hope is so negative? Because his experience of hope was an expectation of something that didn't happen. And so he was constantly disappointed. He'd had so many disappointments in life that hope to him was a negative word. And I think that was, I think we need to redefine the biblical understanding. There is a hope, the Bible says, that can disappoint. We can be disappointed in things where there's many times we prayed or expected things that didn't happen. And of course, when we hope for something in that sense, and it doesn't happen, we are, in fact, disappointed. But that's not the biblical understanding of hope. So we want to look at what the Bible means when it says hope. And how do we understand and apply it to our lives when we're going through difficult circumstances, when we have expectations of things that we expect and they don't happen? And how do we understand hope in that context? Because I think a lot of people right now are going through stuff. I think a lot of people through this time that we're in are going through disappointments, there's all kinds of things you may be going through trials. How do we appropriate? How, do we, how does our faith activate that hope and hold on to that which we do not see and yet have that confidence and that assurance that what we're doing is right and has substance, that we don't get disappointed? Um, we know that uh, crushing disappointment leads to despair and hopelessness. Proverbs 15, 13 says... A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is crushed. So we know that uh, when our expectations and those things that we look forward to do not happen, they can be bitterly disappointing. People have gone through so many things, health crises, financial crises, relationships that they expected uh, and were looking forward to uh, that didn't turn out, disappointment, betrayal, all those things can crush a person's spirit, disappoint us, and make us grow weak in our faith. Sometimes we can really question, is God with us? Look what the psalmist says in Psalm 42, 11. He says, why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Obviously, this psalmist had experienced something of the disappointment of life, and he was speaking to himself. This was a little bit of self-talk. He was saying, what am I going to do? How can, why are you downcast? Why are you disappointed? Are we all go through disappointments. We all go through times of being downcast. And, and how do we understand how do we apply hope in those situations when we're at, at the bottom? This is what he says, and he concludes this. Hope in God, for I shall again praise them, my salvation and my God. The hope is never in our circumstances. It can't be because our circumstances change. And sometimes our expectation about what God is going to do in our circumstances is our expectation. We think we're going to marry such a person. We think we're going to uh, get this or get that, get the job, get the promotion. Uh, we look forward to the things. But sometimes those things don't work out, or at least they don't work out in the way that we expect them to, do they? I think of Joseph who felt he had this promise of God to be uh, a leader and a great person and his uh, brothers and father would bow down to him and he would be someone special and just to find out that he was uh, sold as a slave, then wrongly betrayed and then thrown into prison. I mean, that was going against everything. But Joseph never lost his hope in God. And that's what I want to tell you this morning. Our hope can never be in our circumstances ultimately, but hoping in the Lord. So if God changes your circumstances or if they don't seem to change or in the temporary they don't seem to change. Our, our hope is actually not in our circumstances. Our hope is actually in the person of God himself. And we're going to look about why we can hope in God, even though our circumstances don't always go the way that we like them to go. 
This is what it says in Hebrews chapter 6, 19. We have the sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. So our soul is our personality, okay? Sometimes they've defined it as our mind, our will, and emotions. And what this picture is in the book of Hebrews, of course, is speaking of the tabernacle, and it's using the tabernacle as a pattern or a, a picture of, of us as human beings. So that holy place had three pieces of furniture, if you remember. It had the uh, candelabra, it had the table of showbread, and it had the altar of incense, and that represents the soul, the mind, will, and emotions. And we are, we have emotions. Emotions are good. Emotions are good as long as we're not led by the emotions, but thank God for emotions. I would hate to not have emotions. Uh, we have a will, which means we are free to choose. And that is so important. And faith operates always through the will, not through the emotions. We don't feel like we have faith. We have faith because we choose God. And emotions are like a caboose on a train. They're not meant to lead us. They're meant to follow. Emotions are always the response of something we believe, by the way. So if we believe something terrible, our emotions will follow if we believe the right things. Now, sometimes our emotions will not feel good. We're having a bad day, we feel grumpy, things happen, but we're not gonna be led by our emotions and that's when our will by faith chooses and we hold on to hope. And that's that anchor. And it goes behind the curtain. There was a curtain between the holy place and the holiest of holies. And that holiest of holies represents, you might say, our spirit. And so we all have a spirit and if you're reborn and you have Jesus Christ living in your spirit room, if we can call that, that's that anchor. Guess what? If Christ lives in your heart by faith, he's really inside you. Christ actually, by his Holy Spirit, lives inside you. Isn't that an amazing thought? You'll never be alone because God himself dwells within you, but the Bible says by faith. So it's not something you feel. He is in there, but it's not something you see or feel. We know it by faith, and why do we have faith? Because the word of God tells us that it's so. It says Romans chapter 10, chapter 10, Verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God or by the word of Christ, depending on the translation. But regardless, we have God's word, we have God's presence. So that's what we get a hold of. That's that anchor that's in our soul. And that's that steadfast anchor. Because think of yourself on, the, on, a, on a boat. And that word anchor is a very interesting word. It's something in the midst of a storm, if you're in a boat and you don't want to get capsized, you have an anchor, and that anchor makes it solid. It makes you stable. It makes you steady. And that's the thing we hang on to. And that's the hope that the Bible is speaking of, and how we appropriate it through faith is important. It means that we take our eyes off of our present circumstances. doesn't mean we ignore them. We're not living in denial. We're not saying they're not happening. But we're choosing to acknowledge, yes, I'm going through something. Yes, things are hard right now. Yes, I'm going through a trial but I'm trusting in the God, in the invisible God. He's beyond the veil. He's in that place that we can't see right now, but he's with us, and he's promised to be with us. And as we look at this wonderful promise of God, uh, we see that we have a sure and a certain hope. We can be immovable. Look at the kind of language that the Bible speaks about the confidence we could have. And you know what the release of hope should be? It should be joy. Joy is different than happiness. I had a friend call me yesterday. He said, what's the difference between joy and happiness? And I said, happiness is what's happening right now in your circumstance. We can be happy over wonderful things, and it's good. I'm happy when good things happen. I'm happy when things work out in my life. And that's okay, by the way. But that's not joy. That's based on your happen happenings. Your happiness is dependent on your happenings. But joy is quite different. Joy means whatever you're going through. You can have God's joy knowing that he's with you, he has a purpose, a plan, and he will get you through it. I want to tell you, whatever trial you're going through right now, it may be a long one or it may be a short one, I don't know, but it will all be temporary. God has an eternal plan for you. The thing is, is our faith must be anchored in the person of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done for us and his promises, and he's got wonderful promises for us. And that's that picture of hope. You can be in very bad circumstances and we can encourage ourselves. It's a David strengthened himself in the Lord. His whole world was falling apart. How did he strengthen himself in the Lord? Because he turned to God, believing God had a plan and he, he trusted in the Lord in his circumstances. And that doesn't mean that you know how 
your circumstances will turn out. I don't know how it will turn out. But we know this, that God is able to do above what we ask or think. Isn't that amazing? So God's plan is always higher. So when you have a plan and it doesn't work out and you've trusted the Lord, know this. It's not that you've missed God. It's God doing something higher and better. You know, God's actually doing something better, something higher, something of a more eternal value. But we, by faith, look to God and not our circumstances and not trying always to interpret it. Sometimes don't try and figure out God all the time. Sometimes God will give you a little glimpse into what he's doing, and that's amazing. But even when he doesn't, you can completely trust him. And this kind of idea of trusting the Lord is like leaning on God for strength, trusting, resting in him. Don't take that burden of trying to figure it out. Your, your mind will go through. Trust in the Lord. And in that way, when you're in your storm, that anchor of your soul is anchored in, goes beyond the curtain into that spirit place. And the Bible says that we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, who's seated at the right hand of the Father is Jesus. But we're in Jesus. In fact, his spirit dwells all of us on earth. And so where are we? Well, we're still on earth because of the spirit of Christ within us. We're also seated at the right hand of the Father. And by the way, being seated means you've ceased from your own self-effort. We're trusting in God's effort through us. And he's living his life through us. And he has a purpose. And even if you've missed it, and remember, Abraham blew it many times. I'm encouraged by Abraham's failures, not because I'm glad that he failed, but because I failed. And then I can look to him and knowing that God still can redeem even our mistakes. And that's hope. So the enemy wants to bring you in despair. And this battle of us is not for our salvation if we've received Christ, but it is for our walk on this earth. We need hope presently, our present hope, our present confidence no matter what you're going through, whatever turbulent times you're going through. My dad uh, survived, I would think miraculously, uh, both the work camps and the concentration camps in World War II for five years. Uh, He first started off in the work camps and finally before the end of the war he was sent to a concentration camp basically to die. He was starving to death. He said he wouldn't have lived much longer but he said this, He said he noticed that the people in the concentration camps that gave in to despair did not live very long. There's something about the human will that uh, and choosing to believe and not giving up. But our choosing to believe is not in our own ability. It's not in just hoping for better circumstances. It's choosing to believe in the living God. And that's the anchor. You know, we can believe in all kinds of things. But... We can be disappointed with those things. And so for Abraham, what do we see? We see Abraham was choosing to believe in God. He had a promise from God. And he chose to believe that promise. And that's when we see the promise of Isaac. And Isaac's such a beautiful picture of the hope that we have in Christ. And I love these word pictures here. But remember this. You have an adversary. I don't like talking about our adversary. We have an enemy. And what does it say in John chapter 10? 10, It says this, The thief has come to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come to give you life, and life more abundantly. God, Jesus has come to give us life, but don't think that you don't have an adversary. So there is a battle for your mind. That's why the helmet of salvation was in fact put on on the head because it was to protect our thoughts our thinking and that's what we have to do look what it says about Abraham let's take a look at his battle and he did battle by the way he had many tests and assaults he had to wait a long time to see the fulfillment of the promise that was a test he had a lot who was difficult and that was a test he was supposed to inherit this land and now he had uh, he went down to Egypt and that and then he denied his wife said his wife was his sister. So he was tested and he even failed, but God was faithful. But, but he never gave up the hope in God. Look, it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 18. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As has been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, 
or when he considered the bareness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. So we see Abraham's example. He went through terrible trials. He failed, but he never gave up his hope in the promise of God. And what I want to say this morning is that we have the same thing. God has given us promises. Let's get a hold of the promise of God. It's, it's wonderful. So Abraham, being as good as dead, hoped against hope. In other words, his natural hope was completely gone. Here he is 100 years old. His wife was 90 years old when finally Isaac was born. But in the natural, it was completely hopeless. And what that says to me, and I'll tell you how I apply that. I'm not looking at the hope to win the lottery. By the way, I don't buy lottery tickets. But I'm just saying, I don't, uh, there's certain things we can hope for that are completely either unrealistic or out of God's will. I like what Reinhard Bonnke said about miracles. Miracles are not absurdities, they're impossibilities. So we have impossibilities. The hope that speaks to me about Abraham is the hope to save yourself independent of Christ. That's the real hope. If you hope in anything else, your good works, uh, or anything else to save yourself, or another person, or a false messiah, if your hope is placed in anything other than the living God, the true Christ, that hope will be disappointed. But if our hope is in Christ, that's that hope of that impossibility of being able to be saved. We cannot be saved independent of Christ. And not only does God save us and uh, make us citizens of heaven, he makes us children of God. We know we're going to go to heaven when we die, but our hope is in this present life too. He gives us hope for the here and now. It's not just that we have to wait and be in heaven, but today God gives us grace to live out each day. God has a plan for each day. It says that we're created uh, in Christ Jesus for good works. We're not, we're not created, we're not saved by good works, but we're saved for good works. And that's why we can have confidence though, no matter what you're going through. If you're walking in a surrendered relationship with God, God wants to do something wonderful in your life. He wants to encourage you to trust him every day. Now, he may be speaking to you things in your life that don't line up with his word. And part of our hope is God will change us in the process. He's with us. We all have struggles. And remember that you are in a great battle. And the one thing is the enemy will always lie to you. Um, in John chapter 8, verse 44, it says this. Uh, Jesus was speaking to some people who were pretty self-righteous folks that uh, did not think that he was the son of God. But he says this, you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. So remember that there's this battle. That's why the helmet of salvation is worn on our head. We have to protect our thinking and our hope. Faith is at the heart. He who believes in his heart that Jesus is Lord will be saved. Romans 10 up, just paraphrasing that, okay? But it's a belief in the heart. It's that what really grips us in our inner. We really believe it. We know it because of God's word, because that's what the, the Bible tells us. We stand on God's word. But our hope is a mindset, because that's where the battle is. We have to protect our thoughts. In Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 13, it says this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might, strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So we have God's weapons. We have God's armor to stand uh, and hope it, the hum, as a helmet of salvation is the thing. Salvation is not only going to heaven. Salvation is also deliverance for today. God has a plan for today. And we can walk in the spirit today. And I want to tell you one of Satan's tactics, of the way he speaks to our mind, and I've said this before, but it's really important to get a hold of this. He speaks to us in the first person pronoun, so we think it's our thoughts. But these thoughts are actually generated by the flesh. That is uh, 
uh, the principle of sin. There's indwelling sin, and Satan takes advantage of indwelling sin, and he throws thoughts that we've thought a lot. And the more that we've had these re repetitious, habitual thought patterns that are sinful, the more they grip our minds, and the more they grip our minds, the more they're strongholds. And so the Bible says that we have mighty weapons to take down strongholds. But here is an example of sinful thinking. And it, by the way, it's always negative. You can always tell the voice, test it. Does it bring glory to God? Does it draw me closer to God? And does it give me peace? God gives us peace. He makes us feel secure. And even if he corrects us, it's a clean, it's a cleanness. It, there's something wonderful about it. But listen to this. I don't deserve this. Have you ever had that thought? I don't deserve this. Or God doesn't care for me. Or I'm forsaken by God. Or this isn't fair. All of those thoughts are generated by the flesh, and they're used by the enemy, and they flood our minds. They flood our minds to try and discourage us. In the King James Version, Isaiah 59, 19 says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against them. I love the way it says that in the King James. It doesn't quite express it the same in other translations, but I like that idea, when you're under attack, and your mind is flooded with negativity and attack, your self-worth, your person, your identity is just being put down. You have all this negativity and all these things come against your mind. The, the Spirit of the Lord worries if a standard gets them. That standard is hope. It's that salvation. And what we have to do is we have to deal with these thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 says this. Though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy Arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish disobedience when your obedience is complete. So these are things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. I can tell when it's not the Lord because it doesn't agree with his word. Because I am a child of God. When we feel bad about ourselves, when we feel that sense of shame, when we feel that sense of failure, when we feel that sense of defeat, that is not the Holy Spirit. That's not conviction, that's condemnation. The Holy Spirit will convict us of sin and we'll confess it and then we'll feel clean and forgiven because we know he's asked us. That's how we deal with our own failures and we do fail, by the way. But there's never condemnation, Romans 8, 1. So it is against the knowledge of God. So what we do is we cast them down. I literally rebuke those thoughts. I say, in the name of Jesus, I reject those thoughts. And I replace it with the thoughts that God has given me. You know, in this story, it says, cast out the, the, bond, the son of the bondwoman. Cast out the, the son and the bondwoman. Cast them out, the slave girl. It's not speaking about Ishmael here as a person now. I want to use this. God has blessed Ishmael in the descendants of Ishmael, but as an illustration that Ishmael represents uh, self-will and the desire of the flesh to fulfill it on its own. We cannot let the flesh compete with the spirit. We have to cast those things out that have been ingrained in us, and that's casting out those things. So we're not speaking about Ishmael as a person, we're speaking about him as an illustration. And that's what we, we cast these things out. And let's replace them. Here's some of the scriptures. Get a hold of the, you know what I'm doing? I'm actually memorizing scriptures that speak to me about my areas that I need to strengthen myself in. I do that. Here's a couple of examples of God's word. I'm just not going to give you all the quote references, but they're from God's word. I will never leave you or forsake you. Uh, in this world you will have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. My peace I leave within you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. These are just a couple of examples of how to take those things. Let's strengthen our hope. Our hope is in the Lord and knowing that he is with us, that he's promised that he has a plan for us, and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. See how I'm using God's word. Let's encourage ourselves knowing whatever you're going through this morning. I want to encourage you to trust in the Lord. We're going to pray in just a moment. Um, but I want to encourage you, you can hope in the Lord. I've got so much more I'd love to say about hope. But this morning, I want those of you who are struggling and that need hope, turn to God this morning. And if you've never received Christ, I want to tell you, you can hope in the Lord and you will never be disappointed. It says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's God's word. So if you'd like to receive Jesus this morning, you can pray a simple prayer, asking Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, to come into your heart by faith, and you can surrender your heart to him. Would you pray with me this morning if you've never received Jesus? Dear God, I thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for my sins. He shed his blood, 
and he rose from the dead. And now by faith, I turn to Jesus. Come into my heart, forgive all my sins, and I offer my life to you. I don't wanna do life alone without you anymore, Lord. I want a relationship with you. I want to know you. And I thank you for hearing my prayer, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer and you'd like some more information, we'd love to encourage you. Please feel free to call our church office at 519-438-6005. Or you can email us, odcf at odcf.ca. Thank you for joining us this morning, and God bless you.